Welcome back to the Matter Facts Podcast on the Prepper Broadcasting Network. We talk prepping guns and politics every week on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Go check out our content at mofpodcast.com on Facebook or Instagram. You can support us via Patreon or by checking out our affiliate partners. I'm your host, Phil Ravelli. Andrew and Nick are on the other side of the mic, and here's your show. So you know what's really annoying is when you remember one thing and you forget something else. And I actually changed the intro. I changed the intro for the <laughs> audio podcast, but I completely forgot to change it here. And now I have to change the whole roll in video because it's all like me and Andrew and you're not included. So uh, I, I can get you some be real eventually. Yeah, it's just this whole podcast producing thing is a pain in the behind. I don't know why in the world anybody would do this willingly. I mean, it's kind of fun. Yeah, it is fun. I have to keep reminding myself the fact that I, I really do enjoy doing this. I mean, I wouldn't have done it for eight years if I didn't. But every now and then I think to myself, I'm like, oh, kick my own butt. <laughs> the funny part is when I screw something up on the other show and Gillian threatens to fire me. And I'm like, I don't know who else you think is going to work for a kiss every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely her cheapest option. <laughs> I am absolutely her cheapest option. I work cheaper than anybody she knows. And at least till Piper figures out computers real good. You know, my daughter has no interest in this podcast whatsoever or raising values. She is totally happy to be like, you know, silent in the background, unknown. Hey, that's the beauty of being a producer. If you're a producer and not a host, you can be a silent background. Mm. Yeah, but she would want payment. <laughs> and, well, there you go. And, and for some reason, roof over a head, bed, food, none of that seems well, to that count. count. No, no, no. She, that doesn't, no, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well... Okay, so it's Phil and Nick on this evening. We're going to talk about canning because I don't can. I know nothing about canning. My family has never done canning, and you know a lot about it. So maybe by the end of this, you can smooth talk me into getting into it. But I've before got a we do, grandma that knows a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, compared me and your grandma could swap notes. I could tell her all about night vision, and she could tell me all about canning. But she's not here, and you are. Fantastic. <laughs> First, though, I do have to th read. I do have to give a shout out to all the patrons. Thank you for supporting the show. You make this not be a financial drain on my pocket, which I deeply appreciate. It's not like we make money doing this, but it's really nice not to have to cut checks for like you know five hundred, five six hundred dollars in a month to pay for bandwidth and stuff like that. So it's really cool that y'all chip in a couple of bucks and listen to us ramble on. Also, merch. We've been talking about merch. Merch has finally arrived so for those of you who are listening to this in audio you'll just have to deal with watch looking on instagram but the first proofs from the batch that we, we sent out to southern gals are done the apocalyptic warlord shirt is kind of a riff off a of street fighter i personally think it's hilarious because if you're into my humor then that should resonate with you and then there's what would bert do if you don't know who bert is i question your life decisions and, you know, maybe I'm just the only weirdo that grew up thinking that a guy with a rec room full of guns and a cute wife was like something to aspire towards in my older age. But I'm halfway there. I mean, you know, I don't have an elephant gun. I should fix that. Actually, I know a gal that's got one for sale. Yeah, that's the last thing my checking account needs to find out about. Or 60 Weatherby. <laughs> no. <laughs> Your shoulder doesn't need it either. My, neither my shoulder, nor my checking account, nor my my daughter's college fund, nor my reloading bench. None of those things need to know anything about a 460. I still have this weird urge to build like a 458 SOCOM upper, and That'd I'm cringing at that already. Um, yeah. You know, it, if you have a purpose for it, they make sense. Hog hunting, fantastic. But... How many hogs are there in Louisiana right now? Honestly. Honestly. Yeah. I kind almost a got a I almost got a call from my wife's uncle to go out there with my night vision rig and smoke a whole pack of them oh. several months ago. Well, it sounds like you have justification. Yeah. Well, the problem is like he told me about this and I was like, okay, I got to really quickly gonna get a hunting license cuz in Louisiana, uh, yeah. they changed the they the, they did relax They're the laws game. thankfully. But they, they've deemed hogs to be outlaw quadrupeds, so you can take them 
in like there is no season there is no bag limit you find them you burn them down period in discussion sure. daytime nighttime doesn't matter night vision does, no caliber limitations it's like shooting neutra on the levees out here like you find yeah. a hog burn them down the only problem is you have to have a basic hunting license and at the moment i didn't have one because i didn't grow up in a family of hunters and by the time i got safety. by the time i got the hunter safety course and the hunter and the, the hunting license I called my wife's uncle and he was like, yeah, my neighbor put a trap out for him and got like the whole friggin the whole bunch of them. Oh yeah. The traps are super. Effective. Yeah. Unfortunately for him, you know, we do have a hog problem around here, so they'll be back sooner or later. And when they do, I, I got a PVS 14 and I mean, he burnt, he burnt down three of them, I think with a five, five, six. Nice. So they're not, oh, you can do it for sure. Yeah. They're not enormous hogs, you know, like you could took, you could knock them down to the five, five, six, but the if I had a four, be critical. yeah, but if I had a four fifty eight, I'd be a little bit more enthusiastic about the proposition. Oh yeah. I mean, four fifty eight will do everything, but converting them to bacon on the, you know, like right there in the field. <laughs> For sure. Also, Prepper Camp is coming up in September. It's just a few weeks away. If you're interested, you should go to PrepperCamp.com and you should find out about it. It's probably pushing it a little bit to get in this year, like you could still get tickets. But I don't know where in the heck you would sleep at this point because it's getting really close and the place always sells out. So if you're curious and you think you can swing it, it's worth looking into. And if you can't swing it, then myself and Andrew and my wife and my daughter will be out there this year, along with a whole bunch of other miscreants. And I'm sure we'll be talking about it afterwards. <laughs> so, Nick, why canning? What is canning, first of all? All right. So everybody's familiar with canned food at mm -hmm. the grocery store. So this is how you did it at home back in the day. Glass jars, lid, ring, a little bit of heat. The whole purpose behind it is, is it gives you energy free food storage. Once you're done with the canning process, the food is fully cooked. The food is shelf stable. So no refrigeration, no freezing needed. You don't have to cook it when it's done. It, may, it might not taste that great cold, but the stuff will last a considerably long time. I don't know if this will show up on camera. Oh yeah, this is my uncle's batch of hot peppers from 2021. We're still eating through that because he he grew I think like an eighth of an acre of just hot peppers and canned them all. They're fantastic, by the way. It's pickled garlic and hot peppers. Uh, this one, applesauce. Um, so essentially what it gives you is it gives you food preservation at home, at scale, whatever scale you feel you need. Um, Everybody's, everybody's probably seen the ball mason jars. That's what I use. That's what a lot of people use. They're one of your better brand of ones and more reliable. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a low cost deal on the long term too. Uh, the jars are reusable. The rings are reusable. Some people argue the lids are reusable. I've never tested that myself, but there are people that claim that you can do it just fine for a few uses. You know, it, it just kind of... It extends the lifespan of whatever you're growing in the garden, whatever you buy from the local farmer's market or anything like that from days, weeks to years. So, and, and you know, I'm assuming it's doing this by putting the food in, in a hypoxic environment or oxygen free environment. Like essentially a yeah, hypoxic or a high acid or a super high sugar environment. Yeah. That all makes sense. Yep. I mean, it, that's all going to, that's all going to keep bacterial growth to a minimum. And that's what you're yeah. really after. Yep. Bacterial growth. It's supposed to keep to a minimum. It tries to keep the nutrition value as high as possible, but you are cooking it. So you do see some nutrition degradation and realistically the like, as far as from like taste perspective, at least over the course of time that I've had canned food on the shelf, I've never noticed any taste degradation over the course of like, I think the oldest home canned stuff I've had has been five years. Granted, okay, that's not what the USDA recommends you do, but it, it's worked to, for me. To hell with the USDA. Yeah. It, it <laughs> works for me. 
Well, I guess my question is, is like, and I'm pretty sure you're probably gonna, we're going to get into this more later, mm-hmm. but like, does does the does the shelf life and the amount of taste degradation change depending on what you're canning? Like, because I know that like like my my food storage method has always been mm-hmm. fridge, freezer, deep freezer, sure. and then dry dry storage is really yep. a lot of where we have a lot of our stuff, and that's like we've tried to expand beyond just beans and rice. But that's a lot of our dry storage because the way I grew up, you know, we didn't, we always planned for the freezer to fail. Well, not just that, but like the way I grew up, you know, we grew up on the Gulf Coast. So Mm -hmm. it's never, it's never if you're going to catch a hurricane, it's how many years are you going to go before you get the next one? Or the big one. Yeah. Or the big one. And, you know, the big one can knock out power for weeks on it. Sure. So you just automatically assume if you don't have a generator, everything in your fridge and freezer is gone. If you do have a generator, your days are numbered. You know, like we've tried to make that a little bit more robust <clears throat> over time. But at the end of the day, like if the power if the power was out long enough, everything in our fridge freezer and everything in our deep freezer is going to go. And we're going to be back to dry goods, which is why I've always put the majority of my effort there. But I know from dry goods storage, there's certain things you can get away with storing for a good long time in a bucket with an oxygen absorber. Sure. And there's other stuff that in the exact same environment, oxygen absorber, no sunlight, no moisture, it'll still go bad in, say, six months, whereas other things will last years. I have not found anything that I have home canned, either pressure canned or just water bath canned, obviously, depending on what it is, determines whether you have to do water bath or pressure canning. And we'll talk about that later, but... I've not found anything that didn't get better over the course of six months to a year. And I've not found anything that I, that I was disappointed by after two years, five years, peppers and pickles, they get a little soft. That's basically what it is. You, you kind of, you lose the crunch on your pickles Mm -hmm. in, in my opinion. Um, potatoes, the two times I have tried that, uh, they didn't last that long because it was really easy to make mashed potatoes out of them. Uh, it's basically you just chunk up potatoes in uh, a slightly briny water, pressure can that, stick it on the shelf. The great thing about that is, along with a lot of canning methods, <clears throat> everything is entirely cooked. So when you take those out, instead of having to boil the potatoes, then mash them, you can basically pull them out, mash them, heat them up, and you're ready to go. You know, it, but, it saves yourself a lot of time later. Yeah, I mean, that also sounds like, especially especially given, like, what I imagine most people are going to use canning for is going to be, like, you know, beyond the pantry food mm-hmm. preservation, like in an emergency. Yeah. And in that situation, if it's already cooked and may not be the greatest taste, but you could eat mm-hmm. it straight out of the can, oh, then that's saving yeah. you wood, propane, fuel, or whatever else you need to, to make fire to heat up the food. I mean, and, that makes and even sense. then you're not cooking it, you're warming it. So like your canned green beans, you know, you get green beans fresh out of the garden, you got to boil them, right? Mm. You may soften them up a little bit. You don't have to do that with canned green beans. You, you take them out of your home canning jar, dump them in a pot, warm them up till they are slightly above lukewarm or whatever your family likes, a little bit steaming hot, but you don't have to boil them for five or 10 minutes. You ready to go. Um, so sweet corn, we do sweet corn fairly often. Uh, a few years ago, one of my coworkers associates, a friend, uh, an old family friend of his grew way too much sweet corn for any sane family to eat. So they were giving it away in, in like, the big Rubbermaid tubs full and just dumping those Rubbermaid tubs in the back of people's cars and trucks to get rid of the stuff. Cause it was going to go bad sitting in the field. So I got two or three Rubbermaid tubs, uh, went ahead and blanched it, cut it off the cob, threw it in the jars, pressure canned it. And we're still eating that corn. It's been three years. <laughs> Granted, we don't need a whole lot of corn. Just me and my wife, you know, the little, little, half pint jar or whatever of it is good for us for dinner, but I haven't had to buy sweet corn in three years and it tastes just the same. Doesn't take up any freezer space. To me, that's the bit, that's the real gem though is cause like I'm, I've, 
I mean, I've got like a can rack and I've made a mm -hmm. point of like trying to reserve freezer space for things that have to stay frozen. Yeah. So it's, it's tons and tons of like bacon and sausage and beef and chicken and butter. You can can most of that too. Can't do butter at home. But if you want to, you can do like, say your stew meat. Mm -hmm. You can can that at home in a pressure canner. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to do because you got to cut it all up, season it all, pack it. Not a lot of people like dealing with large quantities of raw meat. And you do have to have a pressure canner. I mean, you know, that kind of um, can up the danger factor a little bit, which is another thing I wanted to talk about. Some of the stuff that can go wrong with home canning. Look, you're, you're dealing with hot things. You're dealing with glass. You're dealing with a lot of cutlery because you got to cut up all of this stuff. So, you know, obviously your normal safety precautions for boiling water, um, normal safety precautions for having glassware around, normal safety precautions for having heavy duty cutlery around. Well, um, when my family does applesauce, this is one of the, that jar there. Uh, we'll usually do a couple bushels of apples at a time. So it's a half a dozen people at my grandparents' house and uh, all playing around with knives, slicing up apples, cutting up apples, and a couple people boiling applesauce. Now, you, you ever been scalded by boiling water, Phil? Yes, on, okay. on several occasions. So, all right. Unlike boiling water, boiling sauces and stews burn you much worse and longer. Better or so. worse than uh, boiling <clears throat> hydraulic fluid, do you think? Oh, uh, probably about the same, probably oh. about on par, especially because like there, there's a lovely memory from my army days. Thank you. Nick. Yeah. Yeah. You do not, you do not want that. So there are two different methods of canning. One's a little bit safer than the other. Neither one of them is extraordinarily dangerous. There's water bath canning, which you can do with any of your high acid foods. So think tomatoes, think, um, some types of preserves like jam, jellies, stuff like that, that are really high sugar also kind of count. Um, hot peppers absolutely count. Pickles absolutely count as high acid. But when you start getting into things like meat, potatoes, soups and stews and stuff like that, especially denser stuff like stews. High protein, high in, starch, in other words. High protein, high starch, low acid. The key is low acid. And if you're worried about, is this high acid, is this low acid, go to ballmasonjars.com. They will have a recipe there for anything you're looking to can. And I, I do mean anything. There's also a like national food safety website that you can go to, but the ball recipes are far more all encompassing. Uh, when you get to the to the low acid foods, you move into a, what's called a pressure canner. So it's like a, uh, like a pressure cooker, basically mm -hmm. just way, way bigger. You know, there's, there's a couple different kinds. Um, the American, they're all American or American clad, I think makes a, a hundred percent cast aluminum with a metal on metal seal. That's kind of like your gold standard of a pressure canner. It's got a dial pressure gauge. So you can read how much pressure you're building. Um, then there's what you'll find at like your local farm and fleet, Menards, Home Depot, anything like that is a stainless steel vessel vessel with a like little wobbler weight system that you set the amount of pressure in there based on the amount of weight you put on that little relief valve. If you follow the instructions on those and you keep them clean, they're perfectly safe. Obviously, the ones with the dial pressure re indication are a little bit more accurate but I've never had a problem with mine. I bought one of the cheap stainless steel ones with a little wobbler pressure valve system. So when you say keep them clean, I'm assuming you're referring to that pressure relief valve clean mm -hmm. because it sounds to me yeah. like if that gets coked up, things run away from you. It can, it can, especially if you have a jar fail in the canner, say like you've got a jar of beef stew in the canner and it cracks open and tries to force some beef stew out of that vent, it's not gonna work the way it should. Okay, so we've gone from dealing with boiling water with a hot mm -hmm. with a hot water bath to, to a high pressure vessel to ba to basically to basically a pressure cooker bomb sitting on your um, your your range. 
If you do it wrong enough, yes. <laughs> oh, the age old, if you do it wrong enough. Right. Now, it, <clears throat> if you follow the instructions that come with your canner, they are very simple. If you are at X elevation, you require Y weight to achieve Z pressure. And it's all spelled out in a table there. Every I think it's 5,000 feet it changes or 3,000 feet it changes. I don't remember how mine was in the book. But they, they, do, they do tell you, if you're outside of one of these ranges, you will have to go to their website and find, obviously, the additional details. But it went up to, I think, 10,000 feet or something absurdly high like that. So, you know, well above the elevations you're probably going to be encountering. You, me, we're within 1,000 feet of sea level. We're just going to use their generic system. Within 100 weights. feet of sea level, but I get your point. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, but I, but the point is, air pressure doesn't change that much within a thousand feet. Mm -hmm. And there again, as your elevation changes, your cooking temp times change. So you do need to know a little bit of your local geography, um, because the the point at which water boils changes depending on your elevation due to the difference in air pressure. Mm -hmm. So the temperature you're getting in a water bath canning situation is going to change a little bit depending on your elevation. Same with pressure canning. Uh, assuming that you followed all the instructions and assuming you don't fumble a jar full of hot contents into something that causes it to shatter and throw itself all over you, it should be a relatively easy process. But there is one key thing you have to remember. If you are going to go away from proven recipes, your cook times may vary drastically. The density of what you're cooking is going to directly affect how long it takes to heat it all to the point where you denature the bacteria that cause, say, like botulism. Mm. Botulism, botulism is a real danger in home canning. Um, that's why... Hand, uh, home canning and store canning, they've got these little buttons on the top. As you notice this one, no matter how hard I push on it, it doesn't move. That means this is safe and it will continue to be safe until this pops up. Same as checking a jelly jar at the, at the grocery store. Yeah. If you can push that little button, that means that jar is not sealed. And it, at some point was opened. Now, I've never gotten sick from home canned food. I know people that have. I'm sure it happens, but it's it's all about mitigating your 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 risks through following the procedures. So, for instance, um, tomatoes. Tomatoes is a super easy one to do. All you got to do, blanch the tomatoes. <clears throat> so you get yourself a pot of boiling water. Excuse me, sorry, allergies are terrible this season. Mm -hmm. You get yourself a pot of boiling water and you get yourself a bucket with a ton of ice in it. You stick the tomatoes in the boiling water for 30 seconds to a minute. That loosens up the skins on them and it kind of starts the cooking process. And you take them out, throw them in the ice bath to shock that skin, get the rest of that skin off. Then you can take it over to your cutting board, dice it up, throw that and all their juices into jars as you go. Once you get the jar, a jar full up to within, I think it's, you know, a half inch of the top of the jar, you take your ring or you take your ring and your lid that the lid you've already, well, okay. So you do have to warm the lids up a little bit to soften the rubber on them. So usually in a pot of like simmering water, just take the lid out, throw it on top, throw a ring on it, tighten that down. And then you put it in your water bath for, I think it's like 15 or 20 minutes. I don't remember the exact amount because I have the recipes sitting with all my canning equipment and I try to keep those handy at all times. I'm, I'm sensing lots of parallels to like ammunition reloading, which oh, yeah, I think yeah. you're also into. Yes, absolutely. Okay. It's just, so the more you talk about this, the more I'm, I'm, I'm sensing parallels developing. It here. scratches the same itch. And if, if you are diligent about your reloading, it's perfectly safe. If you are diligent about how you do your home canning, it's perfectly safe. And if you do either wrong enough, it can explode. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's people have been doing it for a long time. Um, in fact, home canning in glass jars, I think predates 
tinned food sold in supermarkets and the like, but not a hundred percent sure. Um, the other big danger of home canning is the sheer weight of all the canned goods. Uh, I think I figured, all right. So a two by four foot shelf, one layer of quart jars is going to weigh about 144 pounds. Okay. So I'm sensing more parallels to reloading where people don't take into account the fact, you know, the structural integrity of a shelf when right. you have boxes and boxes and boxes of lead sitting on them. Exactly. Uh, one full quart jar weighs around two pounds, you know, give or take, depending on what you put in it. Yeah. Well, so I mean, you, the proportion of whatever's in it to liquid, I'm assuming, but still that right. and the way of the glass jar. All right. The glass jars aren't that heavy, but <clears throat> you know, it, Eight pounds to the gallon, four quarts in a gallon, quarts about two pounds, even if it's just full of water. So mm -hmm. two pounds and up. So, you know, make sure your shelves are sturdy. Make sure your shelves are bolted to the wall. Because Pro if tip. you have, yeah, if you have your shelf loaded front facing like a grocery store, so all your oldest stuff is up toward the front. And as you eat through it, you move more of that weight to the front. All it takes is a little tot climbing up on that shelf and putting a little more weight on the front to start pulling it over. We've all seen how that can go. Mm -hmm. And then you've got hundreds of pounds of glass and whatever miscellaneous food coming over along with the shelf on top of whoever was messing around on it. So, I mean, if you build your shelves, like I build my shelves, it won't be a problem, but I build my shelves mostly with four by fours, two by fours and three quarter inch plywood because they also double as my reloading lead storage. So they're overbuilt. Yes. Yes. But <clears throat> you know, it, if it's, it's like anything else, if you follow the established instructions, it should be fine. And you can find any recipe you want on ballmasonjars.com. You know, it, they've been in the business for a, probably over a hundred years and they don't publish anything that they have not proven lab in a lab. So, you know, you the one time that the you. liability lawyers are working on our behalf. <laughs> for sure. I mean, a lot of these recipes, some of the recipes are 50, 75, hundred or plus years old. I mean, the, we do a homemade barbecue sauce that my great grandmother made the recipe up herself on the farm. And it's not a approved recipe by any liability lawyer standards, but it's been working well for our family for four generations, three, four generations. And nobody's gotten sick off barbecue sauce. So we got that going for us. So what I'm hearing is the first time somebody does get sick, you'll extend the cook time by five more minutes. Five, maybe. Yeah. Or we'll blame it on the meat. <laughs> That'll work too. So <laughs> like, go. what do you need other than jars, lids, and rings? And just, so, just for the uninitiated, because like I know this because my wife goofs around with ball jars, mm -hmm. not for canning, but for other things. The lid is the thing that sits on top of the jar. The ring yeah. is the part that screws on. So the lid is this flat part right here. That is separate. You can, you might be able to see if I turn this sideways, this yeah. little seam right here, this outer portion is the ring that is reusable as many times until it gets rusty. So if it starts to degrade, it no longer tightens down good, or you smash it, they are just made of like a thin tin. So you can crush them if you try really hard. Um, the glass is reusable until you shatter it. Uh, the lid. Again, some people claim it's reusable. I don't reuse them just because they're extremely cheap. I can buy them for, I think it's 10 or 20 of them for a few bucks. So I just have a few thousand of them downstairs on the shelf. It, it kind of sounds like, it kind of sounds like the, the potential in lost food is not worth trying to save a couple of pennies. Currently, you, yes. You know, maybe in a situation where the supply chain was crippled beyond anything we've ever seen, it could be worthwhile, but you know, to me, it's not worth it. Um, another really important thing you need is a funnel. Like a, I'm talking like a big funnel. They mm. make canning funnels that are sized exactly to the various jar sizes. This is a wide mouth jar. So it's almost as wide as the entire jar. Um, I prefer these. It's easier to get food in and out of them, especially if you got stuff like peppers, pickles, 
uh, asparagus if you're going to can that. The longer stuff. Um, Is there any justification meat. to not use a wide mouth jar other than cost. maybe caught? Huh? Cost. Cost. The narrow mouth add. jars are ever so slightly cheaper. It's like a dollar a pack cheaper or something like that. At least last time I bought them. I have not bought jars since. Oh gosh, it's probably been five years since I've had to buy any jars. Uh, when me and my wife first started planting a garden at our first house, we bought a bunch of jars the year before we started the garden. We knew we were going to start the garden. I knew we were going to have excess. So in the middle of winter, <clears throat> once all the harvests are done, your local hardware store will have a sale on their glass jars, their lids, their rings, their funnels, you know, their, their uh, water bath pots, their pressure canner pots. Buy all that stuff then because it's about half the price. What time of year you said? Uh, winter. Hmm. Winter to early spring. I think I know what I'm getting myself for Christmas. <laughs> Watch for the clear the clearance on that stuff. It usually starts to happen, you know, after Thanksgiving, after all of the major harvests are done, um, when the farmers markets are starting to shut down, that kind of thing. Now down by you, it may be it may be a little bit later than up here by us, just because of your longer growing season. Maybe a month later, maybe uh, like November, December, something like that. But well, yeah, it should I'm, happen. And what I'm thinking is, me living in suburbia hell, I might have to make the trek up to the farmers market on the edge of town. You'd be surprised. I mean, every I hardware store in my county carries them. Even like the little local mom and pop hardware store carries them. They might not have a lot, but if you've got like a like a Home Depot or a Menards or something like that, they absolutely do. Okay. Even if you have to order them online, they they will probably have them online. So, aside from the jars, the rings, the lids, and a good size funnel, you're going to need either a water bath of some kind, which is basically just a large stock pot, like a really big stock pot with a lid. A lot of them are enamel. They'll be in variety of colors. They will have, when you buy them new, they will have a wire rack that's, that keeps the jars up off the bottom of the pot so they're fully immersed in water all the time and not directly touching the metal mm -hmm. that is being heated. That's important. Um, a lot of times, right by those water bath pots, you will find a, a hanging panel of these little jar grabbers. It's basically just a, a wire pair of tongs that is got kind of like two half moons on it that open and shut around the neck of the jar. And that's what this handy little ledge and notch here are for. So you grab them right with that. So you don't have to stick your hand in the boiling water to pull the jars in and out of there. Um, I recommend having one of those little retractable magnets that you find at the auto store for getting your jar lids out of the simmering water when you're warming them. So then you can just stick it in, grab one or two lids out, separate them, drop the ones you don't need back in, take the one you need, throw it on the jar. So in other words, they, uh, need, to stay, they need to stay warm until you're ready to actually make warm, them to the jar. Warm but not hot. Yeah. yeah, warm but not hot. You know, you, you want it, you know, above body temperature. You know, some not, probably not more than like 115, 120 degrees. Definitely not boiling because you just need to soften the rubber so that it'll sit down over the glass. Uh, you're going to need a ladle uh, to, to pull stuff up out of the pot, dump it in the funnel. I recommend also having a bunch of garbage beach towels. Now, the ratty ones that your wife won't let you take to the beach anymore that you used to dry the car with, those yeah. work perfect. Lay those on top of, say, like a folding table, your countertop, whatever, just to catch all the mess. Because you're going to be taking, so if you do, say, the, the quantity of tomatoes that I usually do when I do it, it's, it's like four gallons of tomatoes at a time. Cut up and thrown in a pot and warming up. Um, you're going to make a mess. You're, you're going to spill stuff on your counter. You're going to spill stuff on the sides of the jars. The jars are going to be hot especially once they come out of the water bath or the pressure canner. And that towel just acts as a nice insulating layer so that you don't shock the glass or shock your countertop. I have heard of people cracking stone countertops, putting a bunch of jars that are hot out on them because it creates so much heat that the, that it gets like a thermal shock in the stone. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of it happening with Formica. Um, 
The other thing I recommend is a temperature probe. So there are canning thermometers that you can just stick over the side of the pot into whatever liquid you're making up for the canning. Um, in the case of like tomato sauce, uh, you want to go ahead and make sure that is as hot as pot, you know, up to, I think, oh, shoot, I can't remember the temperature. I should have brought that. I should have brought my recipe book with me, but I didn't think about it. Do you think an IR thermometer would substitute? Because I know for some things it, it could. doesn't behave itself very well. I don't know. I've never tried to use an IR thermometer on liquid. I don't own one. And see, I haven't either, but I mean, I have one for like my coffee roasting because you can work. check, you can check bean temperature really yeah, quickly. The black beans would probably work pretty well. I, I imagine it would depend on the color of the sauce. And see, my thought is almost more of like sometimes with highly reflective things, it really right. pisses off that IR thermometer because. Outside yeah. of the pot might be a problem then, unless you have like a, <laughs> like a black stock pot or something. Yeah. Just just had that thought because i'm trying to think yeah. around what we're saying you know you could some people use like uh like for jellies and jams like a candy thermometer that's a really fine thermometer but canning thermometers are four or five dollars and they'll be in that same aisle there's a little metal clip on the side of them they'll clip right over your pot makes it nice and easy buy once cry once it exactly and it, it really isn't even that expensive uh you know, when, when we got started on it, I think I put 75 or or $100 total into canning stuff. We didn't start with pressure canning. We just did water bath canning and garden vegetables. So. That was going to be next my next we... question was, you've been talking a lot about like what's necessary to start with hot water bath canning. But mm -hmm. since we already, since we already said that there were certain things you had to pressure can, Yep. Is there a justification, like if you know this is what you're going to do, is there a justification not to just go straight to pressure canning and pressure can everything? Or are there certain things you really have to hot water bath can and other things you pressure can? Pressure canning takes longer for things that you would, that you can get away with water bath canning. Okay. So in other for words, two, if, if you, reasons. if you wanted to, you could just pressure can everything. But yeah, you're going to be, yeah, you're going to be, I don't think that's, I, I don't know of anything that you couldn't pressure can, but if you're going to do like four or five bushels of applesauce, it would take you many days. Um, because you, so the way pressure, the difference between pressure canning and water bath canning is that you just keep the pot of water boiling all the time on a water bath canning system. All right. You put, you load it up full of your jars. You let it boil for whatever the time is that the recipe requires. Then you pull the jars out. Well, the water's still boiling, so you just stick more jars back in. And it's almost a constant process that you can keep going. With pressure canning, you have to have a certain amount of water in your pressure canner based on the amount of jars you're going to have in there. It'll be in the instructions. Most of them have an engraving on the inside of the, the pot, too, so that you can't really screw it up. There's a max and a min. As long as you're between those two marks, you're okay. If you're not, pull the jar out. With pressure canning, you got a, so you got your pressure pot, you've got your adequate amount of water in it, you put all your jars in it, you close it up. Now you have to build pressure. The time that it has to be in that is determined by when the pressure hits the adequate PSI rating or when the little wiggler starts to do its thing and dance around. That's when you start the timer. So once, so you've got to build your pressure, which adds a few minutes, then you've got to hold at that pressure rating for a few minutes. Then you have to release all of that pressure, which takes a little bit of time. Then you got to disassemble your pressure canner either. Some of them are like screw top, some of them are twist lock, either way. I don't know what you're going to have, but It'll be self-explanatory. Um, you can take that off. Then you can take all the jars out, put new jars in, close it up, and you got to build pressure again. Start the clock all over again. So water bath canning, you can do a higher volume in a shorter amount of time. Um, you can also use larger vessels. So like, I think my water bath canner is a 30 quart, so I can fit, I think it's 9 or 10 quart jars in it. Uh, my pressure canner, I can fit four, four quart jars in. So it, it's more of a matter of efficiency. 
I suppose, why you would largely choose one over the other when safety's not a factor. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I'm just I'm thinking around, thinking around the corners because inevitably you know, someone is going to ask. Well, you can use a pressure canner without the lid on it and use it as a water bath canner, but it's just smaller and more expensive. Mm-hmm. Like a a water bath, you can you can use almost anything for a water bath canning that has a rack to keep your stuff up off the bottom. So if you've got an old stock pot and you've got say a cookie tray a cookie um, mesh cooling tray that you can stick down on the bottom of that and you can set your cans on that, you can use that. You got a, a one gallon pot that you make your soups and stews in and you've got some kind of rack you can stick down inside of that, that's perfectly fine too. But a pressure canner, you need to have a pressure rated vessel. And those go up quite a bit in price. They're, you know, I think the one I bought was 75 or $100 when I bought it. Um, the really nice ones are in the $500 range, four to $500 range. So, you know, a lot of people will try to tell you in the prepping forums and the prepping groups that if you don't buy one of the metal on metal seal pressure canners, you're doing it wrong. I have had the same seal in my home pressure canner the entire time I've been doing canning. So four or five years. So I bought five of those seals. I haven't had to use any of my spares which means I'm good for theoretically 25 years of the type of pressure canning that I've been doing and the scale of pressure canning I've been doing. So I'm not worried about the end of days, Mad Max. If that happens, all right, fine. I'll deal with it when it gets here. I don't have the finances to prep like that. I just flat don't. What I can do though, is I can make my life as easy as possible with the inconveniences we see all the time. Mm. And one of those things is like, I like to have a garden. I like to have fresh vegetables. If you know anything about gardening, you know, when it does poorly, you get nothing. But when it does good, you get more than you could eat Mm -hmm. most of the time. Canning lets me enjoy that throughout the year, the entire time without spoilage. I mean, food preservation is always going to be the bane of a lot of people that are into the preparedness mindset because, like, Mm -hmm. it's – I find it's infinitely easier to convince a person to go out and spend money than Mm -hmm. it is to get them to go out and spend their time and effort so that the things they bought are useful. You know what I'm saying? It's like – take Take guns, for example. Tell a guy, new gun, and he'll usually whoop out the credit card before you finish the rest of the sentence – but the minute you say, go get training so you can use no gu- new gun, and then the interest goes downhill really quickly for most people. Well, that's because there is there is a um, a chance that you will not perform like Steven Seagal. <laughs> oh, we had to you use know. that example, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Steven Seagal is a fantastic law enforcement officer. If no one's ever seen his videos of him actually in the field, that is I... a treat. Fantastic. Our country s- gave him a badge and a gun. Actually, no, my state gave him a badge and a gun. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder, Nick. You're welcome. Not, maybe not our finest moment. Eh, you could do worse. Uh, we do, frequently. They just don't yeah. get TV shows. That's fair. Um, so as far as what else you need, that's about it. When you do it, harvest time. That's easy. <clears throat> really, but just I mean, circle back around. You did say like if you're thinking about doing this for next year, the best time to buy this stuff is winter. Is winter kind of like buying bathing suits? The perfect time to yep. buy bathing suits is at the end of the summer. Winter winter jackets, spring. Yeah, end of the season is always your best time to buy. I mean, <clears throat> if you're if you're really serious about getting into it, you know, you're probably looking at hundred and a half, two hundred bucks to get into it. That would get you a serious supply of jars. That'll get you water bath. That'll get you one of the less expensive, smaller pressure canners, and you could start. I don't recommend you start with pressure canning just because that's an extra investment that you don't need. And most people are going to be doing stuff like dill pickles. A really common one to start with. Everybody likes dill pickles. You're going to eat those things anyway. You're going to I put don't. them on a sandwich anyway. You don't like pickles. I'm Dear not a pickle Christ. person. I've never been a pickle person. I've just... I, there's something in the tape. Now, my wife is cringing if she's listening to this because I should send you 
some homemade pickles. You might like them better. My wife will eat them happily. Mm -hmm. But yeah, next time I do a batch, I'll send them down. I've never been able to make peace with with pickles. All right, then applesauce. Applesauce, like applesauce I could right? do. Your yeah. kid likes applesauce. All right, not so much. Now I am married to a Sicilian lady who will make who makes some of the best freaking homemade spaghetti sauce you've ever had. That you can can for sure. That's high acid. Anything with a tomato base works really well for water bath canning. Oh, I, mean, I know it. Ask my cast iron after she gets done with it. Uh, I mean, like an evening's worth of sauce and a little bit of leftovers. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Not not too long. Well, well, less than 45 minutes. Yeah. Half hour. Yeah. About that. You can make a year worth of sauce in about three or four hours. And then there's no 30, 45 minutes of getting it ready beforehand. You pop the jar open, you warm it up. It's just like you got it out of the store. Okay. Now, how does that work with the ground beef that we usually brown and throw in there? Like it'd be it. Or, so because I know you earlier brown you said ground beef separate and then throw it in afterwards. Okay. Because I know earlier Unless you you're said that pressure meat... can it. I. That I don't know. You'd have to see if you can find a comparable recipe. And then what I would say is try it at a small scale first. Because worst case, you know, if you make a jar of it, all right, you wasted 15, 20 bucks in time. And you just dump it, clean it out, get rid of it. If like it doesn't, it doesn't, um, if, if it seems like it's, creating gas or something like that, that would pop that top up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you, do you guys have a farmer's market nearby you? Quite a few actually. Yeah. Okay. So when the farmer's markets are in season, that's a good time to start with canning, find out what's harvested in the spring around you guys. <clears throat> if it's asparagus and you guys like asparagus, um, pickle some of that. Uh, pickled cucumbers, as far as for pickles, great, great thing to start with. That's all water bath canned. If you want to do, say, quicker pasta sauce and you've got some tomato plants or maybe neighbors that always grow way too many tomatoes and you can get them for free, grab those, crush them up, sauce them ahead of time, put the sauce in the jars, throw, the, throw that jar on the shelf. Then you don't have to worry about having fresh tomatoes in the house. I mean... I do most of my canning when I do have a garden. We don't this year. Um, I do most of it from like June, July, when some of the early stuff starts coming in to like Thanksgiving. By Thanksgiving, most of it's usually done. Um, you know, it you can largely get away with canning pretty much anything you're growing in a home garden if you find a recipe for it. Um, I don't know about pumpkin. I did see something recently where they were saying you probably shouldn't home can pumpkin because of the density of like pumpkin puree for like pumpkin pie. I could see that. And the fact that I don't think pumpkin's especially acidic. It's not. You ha I, it believe, I believe you have to pressure can it. And I don't know for sure if people are, are finding out that it's unsafe recently. So I would look into that one. But like apple pie filling, you can absolutely can that ahead of time. Um, you can do any of your fruits, you know, anything like that. So based on your recipe book, like is, is there a lot of call for adding sugar or salt or anything? Like just as an extra preservative? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. So pickles, heavily on the salt. Um, Makes sense. A lot of vegetables, heavy on the vinegar. So like these pickles or these uh, pickled peppers and garlic here, this is, I think, 50-50 water vinegar. And then I think there's a, I want to say per jar, there's like a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of salt added to it. But it's the vinegar, the salt's there for flavor. The vinegar's there to get the acid up in the environment, just like with cucumbers for pickles, um, just like with asparagus for pickled asparagus. One big thing that you're going to want to make sure you do, um, don't use table salt. Uh, the iodine in table salt will discolor your food uh -huh. and it will look weird and it will taste different. So kosher salt is your friend. I if if any canning that. recipe calls for salt, kosher salt. 
It's the only thing I keep kosher. It never even occurred to me not to use iodized salt or just table salt. Yeah, it's it it does it does make a difference. Now, would it like would it ruin it? No. Is it going to look kind of funny? Absolutely. It's going to have more of like an orange tint to it, which if you do say like uh, well, a classic recipe is um, pickled onions and cucumbers for sandwiches. You put a lot of turmeric in that anyway, they're going to have a slightly orange tint to them anyway. So would it matter so much? Probably not. But, you know, I've never I've never tried it. I've always just used kosher salt. And a lot of times you can get that kosher salt in the same exact aisle that you buy your ball jars in. It will also be on sale around the same time. That so stuff now, does not go bad. So now my question is, is there anything you explicitly cannot either pressure or hot water bath can? Dairy. Okay. Dairy, butter, cheese is not safe for home canning. That, As far as I am aware. There may be recipes people are doing that they claim are safe. I don't know of any safe recipes to do so. In fact, most things I see... Um, say explicitly not to add it. So like if like doing chicken Alfredo sauce at home, probably not a great idea. That's mostly dairy. Yeah. And a lot of butter. You can do shockingly French onion soup. I have seen canning recipes for French onion soup, but you have to swap the butter that you saute the onions with for like a vegetable oil or an olive oil. Oh, uh-huh. It's, I've tried it. It's not as bad as you think. It uses a lot less oil than you think. I could go for the olive oil. I have an aversion to vegetable oil. Yeah, me too. I tried the olive oil version. It was good. It was not good enough that I made a bunch. Mm. So like, if I had to, sure. But when am I also going to have that many onions that I need to make five gallons of French onion soup? Okay, so yeah. so all dairy is off the menu. Pretty much. Sounds like vegetables, meats are okay. Fruits, fruits if you're fantastic. making like jams or jellies. <clears throat> and actually fruits even without jams or jellies. Um, you, I believe you can like peaches in their own juice and a little bit of water. You can can at home. That would be a pre- uh, pressure canning, I think. Yeah, that'd be a pressure canning situation. But with the amount of sugar and applesauce, that's a water canning situation. And that stuff. I mean, it, basically, you're you're trying to desiccate the bacteria or heat the bacteria to death. Those are those are your two options. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. You've made this sound too easy. It's not complicated. It's it's really not. It's it's following a recipe. If you can if you can bake cookies, you can can stuff in a water bath at home. You had to go to can you bake cookies? Knowing I'm a baker, didn't you? I did. Also, I have to make snickerdoodles now, so you're welcome for that. <laughs> I sent you the recipe, didn't I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yeah, like I have all the things. <laughs> like like us like I said, um, for that recipe specifically, the amount of sugar cinnamon they tell you to make is probably mm-hmm. overkill. In my okay. experience, you could half it and still have plenty to roll your your snickerdoodles in. Yeah. And I personally skip the cream of tartar, and I just double the baking soda in the recipe. Yeah, because that's that's in baking soda, isn't it? Yeah. Well, but what happens is that the the, the amount of cream of tartar that they're telling you to add, mm-hmm. doubling the baking soda does not replace that much cream of tartar. So it comes oh, out okay. a little bit less tangy, which okay. I prefer, and it makes them a little fluffier because you're sure. you're basically you're basically putting in more baking powder, less. Yeah, cream yeah of tartar. double double rising them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love them that way. Uh, my, my daughter got a wild hair from behind one time and asked me to add chocolate chips to the snickerdoodles. Huh. I don't huh. recommend it because they weren't bad, but the, ta- the, it's not the cho- snickerdoodles. Well, the chocolate chips totally obliterated the taste of the snickerdoodles. So they just tasted like chocolate chip cookies when they were done, which yeah, she wasn't really so. bad about. But I mean, they weren't snickerdoodles. I love chocolate chip cookies. So, yeah, but there are easier ways to make chocolate chip cookies. But anyway, you know, if if your wife wants to get into canning, if you want to get into canning, your daughter wants to get into canning, you can even can some of the stuff that she harvests in her wild edibles. You know it. 
See, and this is why I need to get her on the show to talk about this, because, like, a lot of the stuff she does, she's actually making, like, tinctures out of. So she's basically, like, basting the stuff in, like, right. very highly refined vodka for right. a week at a time or so. And then and once she jars that up. That is a form up, of jarring, yeah. Yeah, and once she's done with that, it's it's basically shelf-stable forever, because when does vodka right. expire? When you drink Never. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But no, I mean, I, it canning has always been one of those things that like I just I've never dipped my toe into because I've always been, you know, sometimes we get into a comfort zone and yep. my comfort zone has always been can rack and dry goods because yep. it's just it's what I grew up. It's what I've been doing well, for easy. years. <clears throat> it's low effort. It is. And yeah. for hurricane prep for you for down south, you guys, it is the easiest way to go. The only downside to the to canning is it's glass jars and if a hurricane knocks over your shelf eh, your tin food might be a little bit banged up but it's probably going to be okay for a week or two glass jars are not no although quite frankly i mean given where all of our food storage is if that gets knocked over the whole house is on its side and right we have new you're going to be here. having some serious problems either way yeah. So is there anything else to chuck in here, you know, at the end of this conversation? Because, like, I feel like you've, you've given us that canning 101 deep dive that I kind of wanted. You know, if, if you have questions about it, if you want to see something more particular, there's a million YouTube videos out there. I mean, YouTube, you're in adversity for the win on everything. You know, um, worst case... Call up one of your grandmothers. I guarantee somebody in your extended family has done it, man. It's, well, at least around where I live, if, if, if you don't do it and your mom doesn't do it, I guarantee your grandma does. <laughs> Down south, I can't imagine it's much different. I mean, you guys aren't that far removed from the back by you having to, having to settle mostly for yourselves. Yeah. I mean, around here, my grand, well, my great grandparents didn't get indoor plumbing until like the 1950s or 60s. <laughs> There's people down here that still don't have indoor plumbing. <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying, man. You know somebody that does it. You just might not know they do it. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess, I guess from here, like me specifically, I just need to keep an eye on the sales at uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and just surprise my wife, my wife, do what she does to me all the time where she's like, babe, it was on sale and I just grabbed it. <laughs> Look at how much money I saved. Yeah. <laughs> By try, spending all the money. try to see if I can pull off some, uh, <clears throat> some women math. Yeah. Well, you could do that or, you know, just uh, add it on to her stash for her tinctures, just bigger jars. Ooh, that's how I sell this to her. <laughs> I mean, once she tries home canned applesauce, she will refuse to buy it in the store. Mm. If you need a recipe, I'll send you one. Not a lot of applesauce in this house, but if I can convince her to whoop up a big old batch of uh, homemade spaghetti sauce, mm -hmm. that's a I can perfect that place work. for her to start. Because you can, you can do it. I mean, these jars are obviously on the bigger end. They sell them in a variety of sizes, down to little little teeny tiny jars, up to full gallons. So whatever size you want, they have them. Well, and I mean, the best part of it is, is that the end of the world has not gotten here yet. We still have fridges for leftovers. We do. That's true. All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and punt this one out the door. I don't know if you've heard over the mic, but there is a thunderstorm out there that is banging really loudly. No, I have not. There, there's been well, once or twice I looked. At, there's been once or twice I looked over my shoulder, like, "All right, Mother Nature, chill, chill out for just a second. <laughs> but for the listeners, uh, I saw one or I saw one or two people drift in and out of the live stream while we were here doing this. Like, we are we are going to do this show. We're going to stream it out on YouTube and Rumble and Facebook from now on. Thursdays, five p.m. is kind of the time. Five p.m. Central. Unless yep. we get like tons of feedback that 5 p.m. Central is too early, we can back it up an hour. But yep. I think this is going to be the time slot for a while. And as usual, Matter Effects podcast will go out on all the audio platforms. Uh, 
Friday, tomorrow, so mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing editing this evening. Oh, no. Yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. I'll pour you myself a... Thursday. I picked the time. I mean, I'll pour myself like a fourth, a fourth 32 ounce coffee, you know, and I'll, I'll get it done tonight. There you go. That's the spirit. But matter of fact, podcast going out the door. If you want to know more about canning, you should look us up and I'll point you towards Nick and maybe we'll be having this conversation with my wife about all the stuff I can convince her to can once oh, yeah. I embed the thought in her head. All right, we're out. Talk to you on a week. Bye, everybody. Later, guys.